Dorio with my co-host, Barbara Cochran, on your hometown station, KHTS. This is a show for, about, and by seniors bringing information to enhance one's quality of life. And we are sponsored by Comfort Keepers in Home Care and Advanced Audiology. Barbara is off today, but we are lucky to have Dr. Thomas Palucky, a steam chiropractor hey. in the Santa Clarita Valley. Another welcome, episode Tom. Thank of, you. Yeah, another Thank you for ap- being here. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Another episode of the Dr. Santa Clarita style, right? That's, that's right. Exactly. And, you know, there's so many things, Tom, that, you know, we can talk about. We talk about the weather. It's going to be, again, in the upper 90s. We tell our patients to remain hydrated. Uh, and, you know, we want them to have um, quality of life so they can get out into the community. And you and I have both made sure that our seniors strive for that. But most of this show is related to giving information yep. that is helpful to them to keep moving in life. Absolutely. Because sometimes there are roadblocks for them. They can't get over the hump. Uh, they get depressed and they get nervous about being older. Uh, and then... Their caregivers Mm -hmm. are facing dilemmas with them, too, and we try to share information that helps them understand how to do that and how to keep our seniors uh, better in this community. So today, I guess, you know, we have a lot of topics that uh, we can talk about, but, you know, one of them was, you know, out there so often is uh, our medications, and you and I both agree, polypharmacy and how... Uh, the medical professions uh, now treat their patients as give them a lot of drugs, write the prescription, get them out of here, give them a lot of drugs. And what we talk about with our seniors especially is pain management sure. and trying to uh, control their pain. And you, you are an expert at that. And, you know, we have talked extensively in trying to make sure that our seniors uh, have less pain but also in a way – that their side effects are are not too profound. Right. So let, let let's talk about that. Let's talk about our seniors as they get older, the knee pain, the back pain, the headaches, sure. uh, and everything that's even psychosomatic with it and, you know, psychogenic. So uh let let's go with back pain because that uh, of all the things that we see Tom in our offices and even in my house calls uh, other than the common cold, it's back pain, isn't yep. it? Second most common reason for to seek professional help. Exactly. And um, for ever, the answer has been, as soon as the doctor hears the buzzword back pain, oh, muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatories, painkillers. That's it. That's the standard practice. Mm-hmm. I think somewhere along the line, um, medical doctors were you came to the realization that trying to talk to somebody about actually get up and move you know do some preventative work Mm -hmm. um, was either a falling on deaf ears or not within the best interests of their main employer which Mm -hmm. is the insurance industry or the pharmaceutical industry so that perfect storm of influences on the medical doctor has taken its toll and it's gotten so bad to the point that um, there's a backlash now with the Mm -hmm. opioid crisis we can talk for a whole show just on that and the uh, now doctors are forced for the first time to make some kind of recommendation other than a Mm painkiller and it's it's so it's so entrenched in our society that there is a social media campaign that the doctor doesn't believe my pain. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've seen this or not. I haven't but, seen it, but I've heard that before. Yeah, it's, so. it's okay. So I, I kind of support the new emphasis on, okay, your answer isn't just a pain pill. Mm-hmm. And now doctors are being forced to look at that. Mm-hmm. However, it's, so entrenched in our psyche in the psyche of the public that wait a second you're not going to give me a pain pill Mm -hmm. you're not a good doctor and it's i mean we're seeing that so there's reasons it's not that 
you know, you can get into all kinds of crazy theories about why things are the way they are. It's really simple. People want easy answers. They don't want any responsibility for their actions. And the pharmaceutical industry has capitalized on that for the past hundred years. It's that simple. The problem is they're really, really good at it. Mm -hmm. And they're so, they're so good at it that people actually believe that that is medicine. Mm -hmm. That that is what medicine is for everyone from the general public all the way through the institutions that are responsible for training doctors. Mm -hmm. And then once you get through that gauntlet, because medical school isn't easy, Mm -hmm. it is a constant gauntlet of being broken down and reformed in the model of that they want you to be. God forbid there's any dissent in in that process you get out your hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt Mm. and then you find out what the reality of medicine is as a business as an industry in this country and that is that you are not part of the decision making process for the most part there are algorithms there are insurance protocols there are pharmaceutical protocols and you're not allowed to be part of that process for or the most part or you can't deviate from you it you can't you can't you can't make the recommendation that even if you wanted to you could lose your hospital privileges lose your insurance coverage mm. lose your license if you make any recommendation that falls outside of those parameters so doctors toe the line for the most part it's just the easy answer it's mm. what the public's been trained for it's what the insurance companies pay for and it's what the pharmaceutical industry expects of their investment because mm-hmm. that's who pays for the medical education for the most part. But with all the pushback that's going on, and I think you're right when you alluded to that doctors are now being forced to look at pain and issues like back pain and how they're going to take it and take care of it in an alternative manner. Right. Um, they're they're less apt to pull out the prescription pad and write the the narcotic and that's that got us that's what got us in trouble so for the for you and for me there are other simple ways oh, yeah. of taking care of pain and like back pain so i mean you and i can both go back and forth back and forth like ping pong and give those but let's give it to our audience because sure. i think uh, our listeners want to hear absolutely um Real simple, movement is the answer. Mm -hmm. And you may have gotten to the point where movement is not a great option for you, so then you need to see a professional who can restore movement. Mm -hmm. Relax the tension in the connective tissues that so that movement is not as painful. As soon as movement is not as painful and you can move, That's it. That's all that it takes. You've got to get the pain and the tension out of the movement, Mm -hmm. restore and rehabilitate the balance. And Mm -hmm. once you've covered those three fundamental things, relieve the pain, relax the tension and restore the balance, then that is medicine. That is Mm -hmm. that is the body's natural medicine working the way that it was designed to. And I can go into as much scientific validity as I need to, but it's not appropriate for our listeners. Mm. But this is really the way it works. There is no, there, I mean, there is a place for an anti-inflammatory. However, it does not restore, it does not relax the tension, it can relieve some pain temporarily, but only while you're under the influence of that chemical. Mm-hmm. And it certainly doesn't restore balance. In fact, a lot of the issues with the senior population is that a lot of the medications mess with balance centers. Absolutely. And then it creates a whole new situation, which is the number one reason that people wind up in nursing homes. Mm-hmm. And that is a loss of balance where they fall, they get injured. Yep. And then they need some kind of professional care in many cases for the rest of their shortened lifespan. Mm -hmm. With me, I always start off with my patients and ask them, have they used ice or heat? And I think most people now know, you know, you have an ice pack or a heating pad and you at least try those modalities. 
when I was 15 years old and playing baseball, you know, I hurt my back, and you know, I had my parents had signed a contract for me, so here I was playing with these professional baseball players, and but I was kind of racked up to, uh, yeah. enough to where not only pain, but I couldn't walk. Right, and uh, I sought help, didn't take drugs, and I went to a chiropractor, and uh, he, he made some twists and turns, which you know you don't quite do in your practice, but that was what was out there. Yeah, and he. You know, all of a sudden, you, could walk <laughs> you know, again. the next day. No, I was playing again yeah. the next day. Right. And, you know, that that kind of science was in 1966. This is when this was happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact is that, that that science I saw and I said that the doctors, the, the, the um, regular doctors that I would see weren't, doing weren't going to do this for me and correct it so quickly well uh, just to point out in 1966 if a medical doctor made a chiropractic recommendation Mm -hmm. they could immediately lose Lose their their license license that's right and that stayed true up and up in through the 70s so a class action suit stopped that um, and you and I are old enough to remember when that was the case, but mm-hmm. the, the new doctors coming out don't even realize that it was something you could lose your license for even talking about chiropractic to your patient. Yeah. And I think what we'll do, we'll get into allopathic versus alternative medicine because I, you know, that's on a spectrum that now is seen before, you know, some of the spectral light lines weren't being seen at all, right. which is what you're saying. But, you know, there are other things that um, can be helpful for our patients other than taking drugs and the things we talked about. Let's go over those. Sure, sure. So there, there are so many options, and the best options are the body working the way that it's supposed to. How can mm-hmm. we support the body working the way it's supposed to? And, again, movement is medicine. Mm-hmm. So I just saw something where uh, Carolina Orthopedic and Neurological Group, whatever that is, bought a news story that said that anybody over 50 shouldn't be doing exercise, shouldn't be doing... Should not be doing? Well, no, they were very specific in the Uh recommendations. They shouldn't be doing anything like a pull-up, anything like a push-up, anything like a a weighted squat, anything like a deadlift. Now, there is a shred, a tiny sliver of shred of justification in that. However, the way that it was presented was like anybody over 50 shouldn't attempt any of this, which is absolutely ridiculous. (laughs) I know why. I know why. The the reason reason is some uh, okay none of the no, 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 none of those practitioners had to be over 50 right none of them well because they, they don't understand that exactly. that 50 60 70 80 year olds still do that yeah i understand that so the reason being that some of the mechanics when done improperly especially mm-hmm. let's sure. just take the deadlift mm-hmm. i'm not a fan of the deadlift but no, i not. would never buy a news story and put it on the local media saying that nobody over 50 should do deadlifts. Mm -hmm. I would explain that, okay, if you're currently doing deadlifts, talk to someone who knows how to make that exercise safe for you so that you don't injure yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think the bottom line is that anybody in that medical group, if they made that recommendation, the reality is probably that they couldn't do a pull-up. Or they, mm-hmm. they probably couldn't do more than a couple of push-ups. Themselves, and they yeah. certainly couldn't do a, a good, proper squat. And that's why they're making those recommendations. Mm-hmm. Because anybody who knows how to do those exercises mm-hmm. properly knows the benefits of them. Mm-hmm. This is how your body was designed to work. And, of course, you can get exercise wrong. I see it all the time in my practice. Mm-hmm. People younger than 50 get on this kick usually either around the new years or around their birthday or whatever they Mm -hmm. get hit up with these solicitations to join the gym and drop all this weight and get in the best shape of your life and unfortunately they're being trained by people who may 
have special training in getting people to work harder than they're used to in mm -hmm. getting people to lose weight faster than they would do on their own. Unfortunately, they don't have your or my training, especially yeah. my training in proper mechanics mm -hmm. of the you know, the muscles, the joints, and the mm -hmm. systems, and they wind up hurting their clients a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, so much so that I understand why an orthopedic neurological group said, you know what, if you're over 50, don't even do this. However, it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They're yeah. losing all of the benefit of exercise by making such an inflammatory statement. Mm -hmm. And misleading to the exactly. public and exactly. making them achieve other, go into other arenas like taking drugs exactly. instead. But, you know, we, we're talking about management of uh, a pain, but it, as well, we've got, kind of gotten in, into the preventiveness of getting a pain like a back pain again. And uh, when I saw the chiropractor, the chiropractor did a manipulation. I said, hey, this feels pretty good. Uh, but then he took another 10, 15 minutes and said, okay, if this gets better, these are the things that you have to now do, and you're alluding to that right, right now, is to exercise. And, right. and I followed his exercise, what he told me, the kinds of things that I needed to do since 15 years old. And knock on wood, you know, I haven't had back problems since then. Right. So... And I got to play for 11 years in this level of baseball, uh, but at no time did I get back to where I couldn't walk. Right. So to me, you know, the preventive part is as important as the healing part. Sure. So let's let's go to that as well. I mean, sure. You know, the exercise I think is key and important, and that's made a huge difference for me. What else can patients do? Absolutely. So again, getting back to that ridiculous news story that nobody should do that group of exercises let's just take it for they had the best intentions and they're not recommending that people do the kind of exercise that i do every day and i'm over 50 mm -hmm. but instead of making taking that position on it okay what are exercises that we know are not going to hurt you, that are going to absolutely produce proven clinical benefit that go mm -hmm. way beyond anything that any pharmaceutical has to offer. And th this is not just my take on it. This is the, uh, measured studies, very well we talked about um, evidence-based medicine uh, prior mm -hmm. to the show, and we can get into that. But there is a criteria there is you know what you see on the commercials and then there's real medicine which mm -hmm. is evidence-based which means there are large well-designed research projects that tell you what is real and what's not real what's appropriate what's not appropriate and how to proceed so mm -hmm. a thing like walking just mm -hmm. walking, if you're physically able to walk, and if you can walk at a brisk pace for 20 minutes, has better health benefits than any form of antidepressant, heart medication, cholesterol medication, mm -hmm. better statistics across the board, uh, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, painkillers, it does a better job. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people are in a position where they can't walk mm -hmm. for 20 minutes at yep. a brisk pace. So we have to deal with that portion of mm -hmm. that segment of the population. Which I, I deal with every day. And we have answers for that, too. There yeah. are simple things that mm -hmm. you can do. Even if you can't get out of bed, that doesn't mean that you're excluded from any form of exercise. I look at not just what is currently evidence-based because I understand the foundation of proper movement. Mm -hmm. How can that translate into the things that aren't studied? The things that, like, okay, yes. so we have great studies on walks. We can that walk into any courtroom on the planet and prove that. The 
what about the people who can't walk? Uh -huh. There's very little studies out there on that as far as what is the benefit of exercise for these people. I don't care because I understand the physiology. I understand mm -hmm. the mechanics. I work with these people and give them options who can't follow mm -hmm. the recommendation of you need to go walk for a mile. And, you know, I have patients who are using walkers. they got bum knees. Mm -hmm. uh, their hips are bad. And for years and years and years, I've told them, if you have access to a swimming pool mm -hmm. uh, and you always have to have somebody there with you, then let's use that swimming pool to be able to get you stronger and better. And we did have physical therapy pools here in Santa Cruz, but because evidence base wasn't there, right. um, it didn't catch on and they closed. Right. So we're going to take a break, but when we come back, let's talk about evidence based medicine, what that is, and you know, how much one should read a headline and believe it. Right. We're talking with Dr. Thomas Palucky on your hometown station, AM 1220, KHTS. The best live theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The Canyon Theater Guild has been entertaining audiences for decades with top quality musicals and plays. Located on Main Street in Old Town New Hall, CTG also offers workshops for the young actor in your family. For more information, call the box office at 799-2702 or go online to canyontheater.org. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one advanced audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Laura's Diner is the perfect place to go when you're in the mood for some hometown food. Located on Sierra Highway just north of Via Princesa, Laura's Diner offers all the quintessential diner foods like burgers, club sandwiches, and breakfast served all day. Kids meals are also available. You'll be greeted by a friendly staff and served fresh, made-to-order food. Laura prides herself with knowing her regular customers and their orders. Laura's Diner, serving breakfast and lunch daily. Santa Clarita's hometown station. Now FM, 98.1 FM and AM 1220, your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? Welcome back to the Senior Hour. I'm Dr. Gene Dorio on your hometown station, KHTS. We're talking with Dr. Thomas Pilecki, but I just wanted to take a Senior Hour break to talk about our SCV Senior Center because they have a lot of activities over there that are, you know, so conducive to, to our seniors getting over there and getting out of their homes. Bingo! Uh, the first and third Thursdays and the fourth Saturdays of the month. Uh, lots of fun, uh, time to get over and enjoy uh, some camaraderie with friends and also maybe you'll win a little bit of money. Uh, they're having Senior Cinema uh, on October, Wednesday, October the 10th. Uh, they will have, be having An Affair to Remember. Uh, Deborah Carr and Cary Grant, uh, cost you a buck uh, to go, that's optional. Uh, they have popcorn there too if you want. Uh, and then, as you know, the movie has great, great music. Uh, awesome movie. Uh, and Halloween and Autumn Boutique, which is Wednesday, October 3rd. Uh, lovely and unique handmade items. Um, Dr. Uh, Lisa Brassfield will be talking uh, on October the 31st at 10 o'clock uh, on Williamsburg and Witches, which, you know, some people would say there are a lot of guy witches and, and uh, uh, women witches all over the place with Halloween coming up. And then um, we have, uh, notably, on October the 25th, Thursday, from 1 to 2 o'clock, we have doc, uh, pianist John Premick, who will be coming for a classic concert wow. at the Senior Center. So all these things are going on, and we invite our seniors to get out. Sure. Uh, we were talking about how to prevent back problems, and we talk about mobility and movement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, get moving over to the Senior Center because it will make a difference and prevent some of your health problems. Sure. So we were talking before our break about 
evidence-based medicine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you hear the terminology all the time. And, of course, it's scientific. Well, we do. Yeah. Because this no, is our the, focus. I, mm-hmm. I, outside of mm-hmm. me having to go look at research and understanding evidence, mm-hmm. I don't hear it. I don't hear it on the news. I don't hear it anywhere unless I'm looking for something. What I hear, though, are doctors using the term promoting what they want to do mm. and using the term evidence-based research has shown that this is going to work right. to back them up, which right. is good because it is saying that you know this is, this is tried and true. We have done this. Uh, it has worked, and you know, let's, let's go with it. But you know, recently, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine mm. uh, came out and said aspirin 81 milligrams, well, they said 100 milligrams, who knows, but we know everybody's taking 81 milligrams a day, most people, uh, but they said it's not good for you. It doesn't have the reliability that it does. And, you know, for decades, Mm -hmm. we have been saying that, and all of a sudden now, a a prestigious uh, journal of medicine is saying you don't have to take it. What happened here? Yeah. Things change. Of course, if you go back 100 years, b- bloodletting right. was the thing to do. Right. And we don't do that anymore, right. but time changes. Absolutely. So, but you had alluded to the headline and the promotion by this Carolina group yeah. uh, of an idea, but you know, I'm sure they came out and said, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show right. that this what we're saying is worthy. How do our listeners contend with something like that when their doctor or the the newspapers uh, come out and say, use this because this is the right way? Right. The problem is, even though I know you have a research background and I it's a necessary evil for me. (laughs) Like I do not enjoy research. I do not, I'm not that kind of doctor, but Mm -hmm. it's necessary. I I believe it is my responsibility to know what kind of recommendations to make to my patients, not someone else's agenda for my patients. Mm -hmm. That's my responsibility as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, does the general public even have, a chance <laughs> of right, good, of good understanding chance. what their doctor is recommending, or do they just have to trust their doctor? Well, the knee jerk reans- reaction obviously is, well, they have to trust their doctor. They mm-hmm. have to trust that their doctor takes their responsibility as seriously as you and I do. Unfortunately, that may not be the case. We, we talked in the early in the, uh, I opened with. They are under so much pressure just to toe the line, just Mm -hmm. to give the company answer, Mm -hmm. which is going to be uh, some form of pharmaceutical nine Mm -hmm. times out of ten. Like, okay, here's just take this pill and that'll be the answer. It's what the all of the machinery is greased for let's just Mm -hmm. say it that way it's what the public expects it's what the pharmaceutical companies bought and paid for and it's what the insurance companies recognize as standard of care so Mm -hmm. anybody who bucks that system is literally risking everything every their hospital privileges their malpractice insurance their licensure they Mm -hmm. can be out of business like instantaneously for going against the system Mm -hmm. so how does the public know when they ask their doctor whether that is real recommendation or just what they have to tell them Mm -hmm. Uh, the answer is you don't and but i have and i i send my patients sometimes they see specialists Mm -hmm. and My specialists, I feel, are up-to-date, 2018, no evidence-based medicine, and utilize it, Mm -hmm. and which I think is great. But the problem is that sometimes, sometimes what they're utilizing is, becomes a part of the chain of events that they are being told to do. Right. So I tell my patients, go see what this doctor says. We'll talk about it what the recommendations are but also you are you are obligated to do your own research so if somebody says you need 
uh, a aortic valve replacement. And we can now do it in a better way that's a lot safer, even though you're 94 years old. Well, you can look into it because it does give you an option, but we have the internet one. And secondly, I always tell my patients, if you don't like or you have doubts in trusting that professional, get a second opinion. And then we do. Sometimes we send our patients to a higher level. People have gone all the way to Mayo Clinic uh, and Stanford, San Diego, UCLA, uh, to get a, a better opinion uh, and a hopeful, you know, better option for what they want to do. So keeping your eyes open, your ears open, having friends and family around to help you judge the direction right. you are going for with you and for you uh, seems to work. So, you know, when your doctor says, evidence-based medicine says, take aspirin, and you can turn around and say, here are three articles from That's the New England Journal no. of Medicine that says you don't do that anymore. Yeah. So, but there's going to be that ongoing debate. And these, all these things we do in 2018, 50 years from now, and in 2068, it's going to be totally different. Yeah. And we will look back and say how archaic they were. They will see notes from Dr. Dorio on the, you know, on, on the chart. They'll see it on the computer, and they'll say, boy, well, how old-fashioned this guy was. But it was what we did evidence-based-wise, and even the term evidence-based will be gone. Right. It'll be obliterated. Right. And you, you know, you and I, I'm the researcher, I've, I, and you've alluded to that, but, you know, I have a lot of problems with evidence base because it ha it has been corrupted. Oh, of and course, you, everything has. Yeah, and the money has the, especially the pharmaceutical company has diluted everything and you know, I presented a paper in uh, my master's thesis in Indianapolis, oh, IU in, in Indiana University. Uh and uh at that conference was somebody who had falsified data. I, I didn't know that at the time, but they had falsified data and worked for a major pharmaceutical company. Uh, but they were falsifying it. Why? Because they wanted their company to make money. Of course. And, you know, that was, what, the early 1970s. So that has persisted. That has gone on uh, for almost another half century of using now and manipulating what we call evidence-based. There are good things to evidence-based, and there are sometimes things that are not and you right. have to you have to have a skewed eye and go in there and say eh, maybe i'll believe it maybe i won't and use some logical judgment yeah it, it's hard it's hard even for someone like me uh to sort through all mm -hmm. of it but i have a couple of rules that i use for myself one is the recommendation solely based on treating a symptom or is it going to restore normal function to the body? Mm -hmm. That's my main criteria. Yeah, I absolutely. consider myself a functional medicine mm -hmm. practitioner, which means I'm not really interested in just treating a symptom for the rest of the patient's life. I want to try to get them better. Mm -hmm. If there is a way to do that without drugs, without surgery, mm -hmm then it is absolutely in my arena. And if it's not, it's something that I'd have to hand off to someone like you. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But I want to know that if there is an option where that person doesn't have to take some form of medication for the rest of their lives or don't have to risk a surgery that has no guarantee of even giving mm -hmm. them the result that they're looking for, but a real substantial risk of not waking up from the procedure... Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to avoid that at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I, I would hope that every doctor comes from that same point of view. The problem is all the pressure they're under to just write that prescription and get that patient out the door. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the hard part is yeah. making, assuring that you can trust your doctor. And, you know, these days a lot of our patients are seeing their doctor for five or ten minutes. They don't know who the heck they are. Right. They don't know their background. And the next time they come in, they see a different doctor. Right. So this is how medicine and healthcare has changed in 2000 from the past to 2018 is is honestly very different. But you know, I think you and I both come from the same place of 
We see our patients, and our goal is to get them back up, give it, get them functional, and have them have quality of life. Absolutely. And I, all our patients want that. And, you know, I will tell you, once, Tom, once they sense that their quality of life is threatened, they will do everything possible to bring it back up and sustain it. Everything. That's what my patients do. But it's interesting because sometimes I can tell in looking at my patients, and a lot of times they're older. A lot of times they've faced some medical problems, but they'll, I'll look at them and I'll know that they've now relinquished their yeah. idea and their thought and sometimes their hope that they're going to get better. Right. And that's where we you know, change directions for them, help them out through palliative care and hospice care, and make sure that they do not suffer. Right. Uh, but how one judges that uh, as a human being, yeah. because, uh, you know, we're not lie detectors. We right. can't tell. I don't think judges can look at people and say that they're telling the truth or not, but they're asked to do that. And doctors as well. They they can't look at a person and say, well, you're going to you will pass away on August 13th, right. 2022. Right. We don't do that, and yep. we can't do that. But I'm okay with the fact that between now and whenever it is, that they're going to have some kind of quality of life. Exactly. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that has uh, that decision-making process has been taken away mm -hmm. from your average general practitioner and it is really a matter of what the insurance company determines a case that is worth saving and a case that is not worth saving yeah. which is highly disturbing it's mm. not even up to your doctor anymore like the death panel <laughs> actually exists mm -hmm. and that is so scary and d people don't even know that, that when they're talking to their doctor, there is a computer program that determines whether they're going to live through that process or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I have, I have admitted patients into the hospital when they've run the computer program, the patient will be in the ICU, and they have a 5% chance of passing away. And I've written about this as well, mm -hmm. and they survive. Right. And so the element of numbers that you can put in with with vital signs and liver function tests and chemistry panels and all of that. You can put those into the computer, but you're not putting the human spirit and the right. human heart into it. Right. You know, so that's a variable that, you know, changes. Right. And it just depends on a lot of factors uh, with, with the human being. And, you know, that's how we have to treat people. But our healthcare system is now, as you were alluding to, uh, in terms of decision making, some of that decision making is based solely on profit. Yeah, and uh, I think it's unfortunate that we have come in that direction uh, with with especially our seniors. We see it, but it has trickled down to everyone. Yeah. you know, with our seniors, you know, they're going to be very quick and apt to put patients on to palliative and then hospice care just to wash their hands financially yep. of them. And so this has been an ongoing situation throughout the United States. And, um, you know, I, I think people need to be aware of it. But decision-making many a times has been removed. And sometimes we, because we have computers and we have people around us, we can get that second opinion uh, on our own uh, th that that may shape and move a person in a in a better direction right. but that's what we face with our health care system in 2018 um, I was at a meeting a uh, week before last uh, that went over issues related to the state of California you would have hated it because it was really <laughs> all numbers the presenters right. had seven minutes to make a presentation and they only were allowed one slide but these were all you know highfalutin people from all over the state uh, who were doing research and putting numbers in to the, our system to see how we were doing. And there, there were several very positive aspects of the trend that we were seeing. But one of the presenters put, put a graph on the board, just her one, one little chart, and it was a graph, and she said, 
look at this. As she came up, she says, I'm from so-and-so, and and look at this. And there were about five of us uh, in the room. uh, And all at the same time, about 10 seconds after it went up, and my head was turning left and right, looking at the graph, and then I saw, realized what she was talking about, and then the graph itself. And I went, huh? After 10 seconds, and the whole audience went, huh? Because they saw that this trend relative to a group of people in our state was doing very poorly, as they were doing around the United States. But third world countries had better graphs than we do. Yeah. And you look at that and you go, why is that? Now, and she asked, the, she said, here is this graph, look at this, this is who is affected. And the question then becomes why? Right. And you know what her answer was? We don't know. Yeah. And, you know, there was, like, speculation in the questioning afterwards, which was great. Yeah, that's but, the best answer. Mm-hmm. In a scientific symposium, mm-hmm. we don't know is where the good part starts. Yeah. So numbers help us. They direct us. And they, we learn a lot uh, through research and being put out there. But... Um, as decision making has been taken away from physicians as well, the medical, the evidence based uh, medicine that has been out there, that evidence has been skewed yeah. against the American people. Yeah. And evidence based sometimes can skew charts yeah. to where a group of people is not doing well. That's not good. Right. That's not not what we need for the for us and our families and our community and our kids and our grandkids. And again, in the kind of medicine that I uh, uh, subscribe to, the functional practitioner approach, um, those numbers don't mean anything to that patient standing in front right. of me. As far as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. I want to know what the best approach for that patient is not what some graph at some presentation last year said that I should push on this patient. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's what it's boiled down to. These computer programs are all about crunching numbers and saying this is what should be done on everybody. You don't have any say in this. And that Mm -hmm. is just bad science and bad medicine. Absolutely. And it does not do the patients well no. at all. And that's, that's very sad. Well, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, let's talk about uh, traditional medicine and functional medicine and, you know, see how they differ and how they also blend together. I'm Dr. Gene Dorio on the Senior Hour on your hometown station, KHTS. Santa Clarita Philharmonic has begun its season of free concerts. The SCP is a nonprofit community based volunteer symphony orchestra comprised of local musicians from throughout the Santa Clarita Valley who are dedicated to providing quality classical music for the residents of the Santa Clarita Valley. Like the Santa Clarita Philharmonic on Facebook or visit SantaClaritaPhilharmonic.org for more information. All Star Sports Grills is the best place in town to catch a Dodger game on one of their 17 screens and choose a cold one from 23 different tap beers. All Star Sports Grills prides itself on their fresh made to order menu, including half pound Angus burgers. Enjoy an All Star comedy show the fourth Wednesday of the month. All Star Sports has a pet friendly and smoking patio. All Star Sports Grills on Bouquet Canyon, north of Plum Canyon. Lots of people can build websites, but there's one Santa Clarita company that specializes in designing websites for your business, Small Dog Creative. The Small Dog Creative team is made up of local designers who are hands-on. Their talented team of experts build premium websites and redefine branding. Small Dog Creative doesn't just build websites. They'll upgrade your business's online presence and turn your business into a powerful online brand. Small Dog Creative, Santa Clarita's most innovative web and design company. SmallDogCreative.com. The Santa Clarita Artists Association is hosting our annual gala, The Art Classic, Saturday, September 29th from 1.30 to 5 p.m. This fundraiser highlights professionally judged original artwork by local artists in all mediums. For only $25, you can enjoy live music, wine, hors d'oeuvres, and meet the artists in person. The Art Classic will be held at Hart Hall in Hart Park. 
All artwork will be on display for free public viewing Sunday, September 30th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. For tickets and more information, visit us at santaclaritaartists.org. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one advanced audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Hey, this is Ellen Kay, and did you know Exer More Than Urgent Care is open daily in Stevenson Ranch? Exer is the ER alternative that's built and staffed by ER doctors. With on-site lab, x-ray, and pharmacy, Exer has more medical services than a typical clinic. Walk in and be seen in minutes. Open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. For more information, just go to exerurgentcare.com. That's E-X-E-R urgentcare.com. Now FM, 98.1 FM, and AM 1220, your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Welcome back to the Senior Hour. I'm Dr. Gene Dorio with my guest, Thomas Palucky. And we've been having a, a conversation, hopefully helping our seniors understand the the problems and mechanisms that people face through through evidence base that they might see and through medication overuse. But we we're, you know, one last thing that we want to do before we finish up here is talk about differences or similarities between the traditional medicine and alternative functional medicine, which you you practice. Right. Yeah. So, f- functional still isn't mainstream. Mm-hmm. It still isn't common practice throughout. You're not going to necessarily see that on headline news anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, the reason that I am so passionate about it is because it makes perfect sense. It's, Absolutely. It's, not, it's logical. It's not about, okay, well, this number says this on this test, and we're going to give you this protocol to change that number. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's one theory in medicine, how medicine should be practiced. Our approach is, okay, we know that the body does an amazing job of handling pretty much anything that's thrown at it. All you have to do is make sure that it's able to. Mm-hmm. And in short terms, short periods of time, some forms of pharmaceutical intervention, some forms of surgical intervention may be absolutely necessary. However, anything that does not have an end goal of restoring normal function in in the cessation of that intervention, mm-hmm. I have a big problem with. Absolutely. If, if, if you have a number, let's just take blood pressure. Because that is something that people can relate to. I'm not even going to get into cholesterol. That's mm-hmm. a very controversial subject. Mm-hmm. I know that I have the science behind me on this one, but I'm mm-hmm. not going to touch that one right now. Let's just talk about blood pressure. Let's say your numbers get above 140 over 90. Boom. Knee-jerk reaction needs to be on medication. Mm-hmm. So when that takes place, is the goal of that medication to correct the actual causative factor, or is it just keeping that number below 140 over 90, and as soon as you stop the medication, it starts creeping back over 140 over 90? I've got a problem with that rationale, with that Mm -hmm. protocol, with that methodology. So instead, why not figure out a way that you can without constant intervention, without having to take a pill every day for the rest of your life, get that number to an acceptable place. That's the difference between functional medicine and pretty much Mm -hmm. where conventional medicine is right now. Mm -hmm. But from... And I think they can blend beautifully. They they are. They do blend because that's what I do. Because I, as you know, I do functional medicine as well in my beliefs because I know if it works, then we do it. Right. You know, and we hope that the endpoint brings the patient back to a normal lifestyle. That's what we're looking at. But 
you know, we, we talked about, you know, here I had my ex chiropractic experience even before I went to medical school. And so, you know, on that, that spectrum of, of medical care, you know, for me, chiropractic care is, is worthy. Uh, but I also see that acupuncture is, sure. acupressure is, uh, neuropathic care is, is, is worthy, herbal medicine, uh, biofeedback, something called EMDR. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things that are out there that um, wor I think works. And my patients have come back and said, yes, it works. That, to me, is the bottom line. So why everything isn't all on the same level and it's just – how they fit on the spectrum, what the ultimate uh, goal is to get the patient better, that's where it should be. Yeah. You know, the, I think the big load, though, is for people, for the syst people to look at the system and say, it sure is heavy-weighted in using medication and sure. drug drugs, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be concentrating on that uh, by itself. Yeah. Unfortunately, as long as there is so much money being generated by mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical industry to influence the education process, the legislation process, and the, um, the education process of the doctors, but also the education process of the public, mm -hmm. of this is what medicine look like this is what health looks like mm -hmm. um, it's a very hard battle so it's, it's 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 always gonna come back here's the silver lining however that system has become so incredibly expensive mm -hmm. that it is unsustainable and so now we are being forced to take a look at what everybody else is doing so much better mm -hmm. than we are, and that's where functional medicine comes in. And that pushback is there. I just love the fact that people and the citizens are, you know, holding people's feet to the fire and making them accountable. If our listeners want to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Well, the best phone number for me is 661-753-9340. That's six six one seven five three nine three four zero. Great discussion. Always. Tom, as usual, Dr. Thomas Palucky. We are sponsored by Comfort Keepers in Home Care and Advanced Audiology. Listen to us next week on the Senior Hour. Now go and enhance your quality of life.